Okay, we're going to be talking about the Enlightenment and the concepts of government that came about during that time period. So, the main thing to remember is that the center of all of this is the concept of man. Now, man is where the power actually is this time. So, man, through a concept known as popular sovereignty, gives the ruler the ability to rule. The legal authority is with the people. So the people are giving this authority to the ruler. And the people are asking the ruler to protect them. And the ruler has a responsibility to look out for the people and be very nice and help them. So this concept um, that there's a protection is called the social contract. And the social contract was designed by a man named John Locke. And John Locke was British and he witnessed the glorious revolution that happened in the late 1800s in England where they went from an absolute ruler to a constitutional monarch. And what it all comes down to, really, is this concept of limiting power. Whose power? The ruler's power. So the king, who used to be an absolute ruler, now has to answer to the people through concepts like John Locke's social contract in which the ruler had to protect the natural rights of man. And those natural rights were life, liberty, and property. So according to John Locke, those were the main things. Life, liberty, and property. Now what happens if a ruler isn't protecting those things? Well, then the people have the right to rebel. So protect or right to rebel. Now, the ruler, so the ruler is responsible for the welfare of the people the popular sovereignty, the legal authority is with the people. They give the ruler the right to do that. And also, the laws need to be made by man. So there's no ruling by the whim of a ruler. That doesn't work anymore. It's the laws by the people. That's the main focus. So again, we're limiting power through laws, through protection, in the social contract, and there's also the concept that there should be a separation of power. And the separation of power comes idea that comes from a guy named Montesquieu and Baron Montesquieu is from France and he builds upon what Locke has said about a social contract and a constitutional monarchy so we'll add that we've got a constitutional monarchy that means that the monarch has to abide by a constitution, and the constitution is written by the people. And Montesquieu also thinks that there must be a separation of power. And that is important because it is going to be one of the cornerstones of some of the revolutions that happen. For example, the American Revolution, our system of government, we ended up with a three-part system. We've got a president, we've got a judicial branch with the Supreme Court, and we've got the legislature, and there's checks and balances to make all of those groups 
um, none of them can be too powerful. So this concept of separation of power definitely ties in to the limiting of the ruler's power overall. Now, with the separation of power, obviously the people have to be involved in the government. Now, the people, who does that mean? To the philosophers of the Enlightenment, that definitely did not mean everyone. So, no democracy. That is not going to come about until the 1800s, that concept. So right now, there's no democracy, but there is equality before the law. So the law, the laws are put into place to treat everyone fairly. So that everyone has the same status in the eyes of the law. This is an important new concept. And it will be used in the revolutions, especially the French Revolution, where nobles and members of the clergy had specific privileges based on their status. However, it's really important to note that there was no change desired by these philosophers who, you got to remember, are elite people, they're wealthy, no change desired for the socioeconomic status of the masses. And that's very important. So no participation in government. They are uneducated, they aren't able to handle it, yet they should be treated equally before the law. And one way that they should be treated equally um, is that all criminals, and this is another person to know, um, Beccaria, he was a, from the Italian peninsula, he believed that capital punishment should be abolished. So in 1764, he published a book called On Crimes and Punishments Against the Death Penalty. All right. So these new ideas of equality before the law, helping to reform people, making changes for the betterment of society, yet not actually changing the social status. There's no class hopping going on here. Now another person, so we've got John Locke is kind of the first. He was working in the late 1600s, 1700s, then Montesquieu in the middle of the 1700s. And then we have another guy named Rousseau. And Rousseau is a little bit different in terms of his ideas. Now he also had a social contract, but his social contract was not between the ruler and the people. It was a social contract created by the individuals of a community. So it's based on the community coming together for the will of the people. And that will of the people is what the ruler needs to make sure happens. So it's it's different. It, there's more focus on community with Rousseau. So all of these people are still focused on limiting the power of the ruler. They think that the ruler needs checks and balances, that there is definitely a right to rebel if the ruler is not enacting those protections and not going by the separation of power. And therefore, these philosophers believed in limiting the power. There was one philosopher who didn't, and that is Voltaire. Now, Voltaire was a very important part of the Enlightenment. He was pro-religious toleration. He was a deist. 
And in terms of government, he wanted an enlightened, absolute monarchy or an enlightened absolutism. He felt that through reason, rulers could rule, taking the good of the people into consideration. And using these changes that we have found with religious toleration and the concept of freedom of the press, a ruler could put all of these things into place for the betterment of society. Voltaire had long been an admirer of Louis the 14th, who was, up until that point, the biggest ruler that Europe had ever seen. He had the most power combined into one person ever, as he was ruler of France in the late 1600s, early 1700s. So Voltaire really admired him. And with his enlightened absolutism, Voltaire also kept in touch and had patrons throughout Europe. And one of those was Catherine the Great. They corresponded a lot. They talked about their ideas. Catherine even started to redo some of the judicial code in Russia before there were some uprisings that made her stop her consideration of these new ideas. So for the most part, everyone in terms of the philosophers' ideas on government were for limiting it. But Voltaire felt that a ruler who could use reason and their knowledge and progress could be an enlightened absolutist to make way for progress. And one of the ways of progress that everyone, almost everyone agreed on, was education. And some even believed that girls should also have better education as well. And so that comes as part of the concept that the ruler is responsible for the welfare of the people and that the ruler's responsibility to help improve the lives of their subjects and education could be a big part of that because proper education leads to knowledge and knowledge is progress. So you want to have an increasingly educated population. But at the time the philosophers were speaking, this just wasn't um, on the cards just yet. So that's a little bit more of a detailed look at the government and the ideas the philosophers were proposing based on enlightenment principles. <laughs>